Welcome to all in the room and on Zoom to our seventh seminar of the Exposure CRE seminar series. I'm Michelle Atta, one of the co facilitators of the seminar series. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous elders, past, present, and emerging. In addition, I would also like to pay my respects to the Warren Treaty people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. We warmly welcome you and are just delighted to have Professor Ian Nebo as one of our chief investigators of the Adventure CRE from the University of Technology, Sydney, presenting today. Some housekeeping to begin. Please be patient with us and the technology today. We are gathering many attendees across many Zoom sites, uh, Zoom links, um, and our apologies in advance if there are any disruptions to your viewing during the seminar. Occasionally, attendees join late via Zoom and there may also be some background noise which we'll uh, endeavour to reduce. To enhance everyone's Zoom experience, please do mute your microphone, turn off the video and minimise the Zoom gallery. Thank you. This seminar is being recorded on Zoom and will be available to access um, as web webinar videos for playback via our CRE website. So just click on the resources Videos are usually uploaded one to two weeks after each seminar, and all previous seminars have been uploaded to view. There's a nice pool of them already. Next, questions for this seminar will be aided by the use of Slido. You can log in anonymously or with your name or initials, and you'll be able to see all the questions put forward by other audience members. It's a great way to engage with the presentation experience and it allows you to ask questions online so that you can then continue to present. Our event code is 2509. Enter your question under the um, survey tab at any time, and, or the question tab, sorry. And if you like a question, click thumbs up because this button will elevate those questions to a higher priority. Ian will answer as many questions as time will allow. For now, we would love to track attendee numbers, so if you have two or more people gathered, Please do jump onto Slido, come into the survey section and answer the first question there about group size. Thank you so much. Please also engage with us on social media by Twitter and Facebook. Feel free to tweet along today and use our hashtag AsiaCRE. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ian Nimbo, Head of Clinical Psychology at the University of Technology Sydney. He's the Chief Investigator with us at the Aphasia CRE and leads research program for optimising mental health and wellbeing. Ian is also a Chief Investigator of two other major NHMRC funded research streams in stroke and has a focus on people with aphasia. Ian is a visiting professor at the University of Surrey in the UK. He is a clinician and academic with extensive clinical and research experience with both older and younger people stroke. He's published widely in this area, including studies concerned with the identification and treatment of emotional disorders and the organisation of service delivery. Thank you so much, Ian. Just sorting the technology, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me, Carolyn? Uh, sorry, Michelle. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. Um, and uh, it's a delight to be presenting uh, on behalf of this uh, seminar series with the CRE. Um, there's great company and great people involved in this project, too many for me to mention. Um, but, uh, particularly, I'd like to give a shout out to Michelle Attard. Carolyn Baker and um, Brooke Ryan, who are postdocs. And what that means really is we translate research to practices. Um, they do all the work. Um, I talk about it a lot. So thanks to you guys in particular and for your organization today. I'm gonna to be talking about psychological management of stroke. And my slides aren't shifting. Let's see if we can, oh, there we go, we'll move that way. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things I could say under this topic. Um, 
the things I'm really going to concentrate on is the psychological impact of stroke, how we screen for emotional problems in this difficult and challenging population, and managing psychological problems after stroke. And I'm going to wind up thinking about how we're looking at this, particularly from the point of view with aphasia. But my talk today is going to start really looking in general terms at psychological management of stroke in terms of identifying and managing emotional problems. So the things I'm not gonna consider, which are really important topics, and I, I'm gonna list them now for those of you who want new research projects. Um, and um, because it, we don't wanna miss out on some of these things as we move forward with the CRE and in terms of stroke research in general. So things like what people get out of a stroke that's on positive, the silver lining, like post-traumatic growth, very important. I'm not gonna talk about care assessment intervention. That's an important part of the CRE we're looking at. Um, so there's uh, a lot more work that could be done in that area. Cognitive deficits after stroke are very important and cognitive rehabilitation is an emerging opportunity for uh, changing the quality of life of people after stroke. Also very important in terms of prevention, managing primary and secondary behavioural risk factors, things like exercise, diet, substance use, medication adherence. Um, you know, if you don't take your anti-cholesterol drugs, you can be in problems. Um, also not considering things like emotional ability, which is a special part of the behavioural uh, impairment that can occur in stroke. So it's the motor control of emotions after stroke it can be quite disabling for some. Uh, and very importantly for those who uh, aren't on a trajectory of recovery, but uh, going the other direction, um, end of life decision-making after stroke, including things that involve palliative care. Um, and I'm also not gonna talk a lot about some of the uh, specialised conditions or more uh, less prevalent conditions like PTSD, which do require specialist services after stroke. So forgive me for all that. Um, other things, breaking bad news in stroke, goal setting, interventions for incontinence, vascular dementia, providing information, the best way to do that, rehabilitation experience, how do we can do it better and people experience their rehabilitation recovery better from the point of view, what we're doing. There is a really good book on this topic if you want some more on that. And, and of course I'd say that, wouldn't I? Um, but uh, do, do dabble with that if you uh, want to look at some of those other areas. So we all know uh, about the, the, the pathology of a stroke, but we need to know that it can cause virtually everything to, to stop working for you, uh, including uh, killing you. But of course, if you do have uh, a, a recovery, about a third of people have problems like inability to walk, undertake their activities of daily living, like washing and dressing, incontinence could be an issue, inability to drive, inability to manage one's own affairs. So in a very functional way, um, stroke can afflict an individual. In terms of psychological impact, we do know cognitive changes. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but that occurs for you know up to three quarters of people with stroke, uh, depending on when you measure it and how you measure it. Uh, and very importantly to this CRE, uh, for up to 50% of people, there's some sort of communication disorder whether or not it completely meets the criteria for aphasia. One of the best models I find to explaining uh, the psychological impact or the emotional impact of stroke is the Scots model, uh, unsurprisingly coming from Glasgow University. Um, and it talks about a very important way and mental model that stroke can inflict one. So we work with an assumptive world where we have views and beliefs. For instance, a belief like I have to be healthy to be happy. Obviously a stroke can uh, uh, intervene with uh, a challenge to the assumptions about how the world should be and how I should be or you should be in the world. Very importantly in stroke in terms of cognitive changes that we can include for up to 75% of people, there's a capacity to be self-aware that can intervene in these structures in a way that uh, they're disconfirmed or, or, or are confirmed in terms of allowing a person's response, and that can be an interpersonal response or an interpersonal response. So how uh, you know, someone is, gets upset about things um, and perhaps gets angry, how they interact then with other individuals as they um, move on forward through their stroke recovery makes a big difference. And it's all mediated through this, this, this very important uh, ability to communicate and the cognitive deficits. And the model was really developed in terms of uh, the fact that bereavement models alone didn't capture the complexity of stroke experiences and that, that understanding that adaption is a dynamic goal-oriented process 
and that you know people have positive as well as negative experiences as i talked about uh, post-traumatic growth was one area of research that's developing in the stroke area so we're not talking about the assumptive world beliefs about independence productivity being healthy shape by initial experience you know in sudden paralysis increased dependence on others uh, changes even changes in routine you know you can't go back to work you can't go down the path all these things that can make a real difference to uh, your understanding and the way you are being in the world. Things like your own response, you know, the, uh, say a view that I should have 100% recovery can augment and uh, detail an emotional response. And, you know, the attempts to rate, regain control. You can talk about this in terms of people who are often seen in stroke rehabilitation with problem behaviours because um, they're so dependent, they're trying to regain control of their world and they can sometimes do that in a maladaptive way and that's sometimes when clinicians uh, become concerned and uh, talk to psychologists about how to manage situations and this sort of model explains distress positive experiences as well as clinical levels of emotional disorder so you start with beliefs held about your world and the place in it you have these subsequent experiences um, and that's shaped by beliefs about the world and yourself and they are challenging leading to stress changes in your thinking skills which add to cognitive deficits and attempt to cope uh, and the emotional reaction ensues in that environment so what are the emotional problems after stroke well um, they're very common much com more common than in uh, the general population so depression about 30 percent at any uh, point post stroke uh, and for people we're concerned of within the CRE, that's approximately double, 60% of people. And with respect to depression, that's clinical levels of depression. So people meeting the DSM-5 criteria uh, for the disorder. Anxiety between 19 and 25% of people, depending on how you measure it. And in our own studies, uh, up to 44% of people with aphasia have significant anxiety as well. Often overlooked, but some work we've done is very important is that, you know, between 30 and 90 percent of people post stroke and that's quite a broad um, parameter i know uh, can have a fear of falling and that's a very important element of stroke we won't be talking much about that today but it can be very disabling because people stop doing things in case they fall and of course that leads to deterioration uh, and more emotional distress and reduced quality of life So despite its prevalence, depression commonly is, particularly in Australia, has remained undiagnosed. And, you know, there's multiple reasons for that. Obviously, of course, uh, one of the ones I haven't actually got there is the fact that, you know, you know internal states like depression and anxiety are, are less likely to be noticed. But also the overlap between symptoms of stroke and those of depression, things like fatigue, and how do you assess people who can't communicate or don't have the executive function to self-observe and describe their internal state? Much overlooked sometimes the nature of depression in older people. Older people report less low mood. So think about that. One of the hallmark symptoms of younger people that we think about with depression, the fact that they're sad and despondent is often not present in older people and that more physical symptoms are commonly reported. So obviously that impairs the ability to assess these things. And certainly historically and, and currently in Australia, but not in other countries, which is a reason we're uh, researching it, it's difficult to know what tools to assess and who's responsible for those things in a stroke team. So if it's too hard and no one's specified to do it, it's not done. And just to, uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, psychiatrists or psychologists that um, you know these are some of the things that occur co-occur in depression and um, uh, stroke and can be uh, reasons that um, things like mood state are overlooked so hypersomnia psychomania retardation in particular fatigue diminished concentration all of these things occur in depression uh, and um, also occur in stroke and can add uh, in combination to the presentation of those uh, in, in, uh, in people post-stroke. Since anxiety is sort of the same, same sort of thing, not surprising, fatigue's also evident there, physically tense, which happens, you know, people get high tone, sometimes um, uh, the spasm and uh, so forth after a stroke, so that can be an issue 
uh, inability to concentrate, un unable to sleep. So a lot of those things common, of course, with depression as well and unsurprising anxiety and depression uh, coexist at quite a high rate in people post-stroke. When we talk about screening for depression, one of the things that my uh, colleagues I work with, occupational therapy colleagues in the UK happen is they'd think about screening and then they'd go to the literature and they'd go, well, what should we use? And then if you look at depression, these are all instruments that have been validated in people after stroke. So if you're not a mental health practitioner, you know, and not, or not untrained or not practicing in mental health, that's a plethora of interest to try and work out what to use. And that's, that's problematic because as I said before, then nothing is used. One of the most common things that we sometimes use though is the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Um, and let's just think about that from the point of view of cognitive problems. You have to hold in your mind a statement and then compare it to four alternatives. So you can see why I, um, things like the hospital anxiety and depression style alone aren't good enough to screen for post stroke. So that's useful for people under the age of 65. Um, but as I'll be talking about later, a little bit less useful for older people. So some of the things that we do use that are recommended, the depression intensity scale circles, the SADQ, stroke based depression questionnaire, the BOA, and so on. Those latter two for people with cognitive and communication problems in particular are useful because they're observer me measures. So the DIS, uh, I won't go into this in detail, but you know, very simple instrument you can administer to most people, even people with cognitive and communication problems. And there's a simple no depression grade scale up to most severe depression and two or more is considered uh, in a clinical range warranting further assessment in that instrument. Uh, and the stroke phasic depress near yeah, 10 items. Uh, there's a reverse scoring on item 10 for the uninitiated, be careful of that. A cut off for six or more. And it looks a bit like this. And this can be done by staff and there's version done by carers as well. So, you know, does he, she have weeping spells every day this week, four to six days this week? Um, that's not at all. The bow is something we developed with uh, colleagues at Cardiff University and uh, have been using successfully in clinical situations for some time now. 10 items based on mood, based on mood related behaviors observed by the carer. And we've got a cutoff for 17 or more on that. And it looks a little bit like this. Well, a lot like that actually. So when we did the validation of the bow, it was kind of really interesting in terms of its importance. Uh, it's got good sensitivity and specificity. And you know, when people have relaxation, their anxiety changes. So that's kind of a nice piece of work that we've been able to do there and uh, deliver to people with aphasia. Um, so some good results. And those of you who, who love a good o ROC curve, there you go. So one of, one of the problems, as I was saying, is we have these instruments, but how do we get people to use them? Uh, and one of the things is um, when I was working with a, a group of physicians and I was saying, well, you could use this or use that, they all said, no, just tell us what to do and when. And given those guys have you know, had 12 years of academic training and, and lots of things, if, if they're wanting something straightforward and simple, uh, it's obviously something that's uh, not going to be such a bad idea. So basically, over the years and the way we've developed the screening, it's improved remarkably in places like UK, although I can't take sole responsibility for that, of course, because a lot of people have developed different protocols for this. But considering age, disability, cognitive communication disorder, this has been able to get people who aren't trained in mental health or aren't practicing in mental health, i.e. stroke unit you know, clinicians, to be able to regularly screen um, for these difficulties. And it looks a little bit like this. So you have a situation where um, you move around and you do these, uh, you say, does patient score above 17 or not on the BOA observation? And then you feed back the results of the patient. So this is an example of someone with cognitive communication problems. Very important to put notes in the, uh, in the medical file. So if depression, use the SADQ10. So what we're saying is this is what you do, this is what Cut off you use. If something happens, what do you do then? And it's all covered. With, with depression, we think it's worth um, asking, uh, even someone with common communication problems about that, if it's meaningful to do so. 
obviously you also wonder if people are running around in front of traffic or uh, searching for the drop trolley, that can be an indication of uh, some concerns as well. So developing these protocols is one way we've been able to improve the assessment and identification of problems that can then be uh, further assessed by qualified practitioners and in, including that things like risk. So the, the screening I've just shown you was from a, um, uh, uh, an inpatient setting. So this is something we developed for use in the community and many of you know the patient health question in nine eyes, which includes a, uh, a suicide question and the SADQ10, which is a carer version of the stroke aphasic depression questionnaire. And for anxiety, we did initially want to use the HADS-A, but we found the geriatric anxiety entry much better for that, people at 65 and above. Um, and I, you know, I would, not wanting to complicate the screening, but it's very important to look at the right screening instrument for the right population. So we found the hospital anxiety and depression scale uh, at a cutoff of six of seven had very good sensitivity and specificity and well, the hospital anxiety depression scale, not so much when we're just looking at older people. Um, so, you know, really using things like the GAI is much better. And um, sometimes we're torn between, you know, what's pragmatic to use because the hospital anxiety depression scale gives you an anxiety and a depression scale and, and the best supported instrument from the research we've done. So one of the things that um, we move on to after we, you know, we've solved the screening issue, um, apart from translation to practice, and I've got a PhD student, Rebecca, who's working on that at the moment in an Australian uh, clinical setting, is um, what do you do when you're identifying these problems or what do you do to prevent these problems in a stroke population? And one of the important things we've looked at is a step psychological care approach. This has kind of arisen from models, particularly in the UK, of IAPT, improving access to psychological therapy. And it really looks at applying that to a stroke situation. And it really looks uh, like this. Um, unfortunately, there should be a big triangle in the med middle there. I don't know what's happened to my PowerPoints, but basically there's a triangle and at the top is severe and challenging behavior. So that's the top level, the most demanding of services. But at the bottom, we're looking at all clients getting access to things like support groups, befriending, music and art therapy, leisure rehabilitation, motivational interviewing, things which have got uh, some support in the literature for um, preventing problems. Um, and the idea about step care is you can step between one and the other. So if you look at the, the left hand side there, you can see the had score for depression greater than nine, then you'll be looking at some of those more formal interventions. And you know, when people are getting very high scores, have got suicide ideas, self-harm, things like PTSD, then specialist mental health services and cognitive behavior therapy uh, uh, services are required. Okay, so um, I'm moving along quite quickly here. Um, the uh, very important to think about what we're doing in the aphasia space with respect to these difficulties after stroke. And um, the program we're moving ahead to do this has the goals of optimising the mental health and psychological wellbeing of people with aphasia and their families by understanding the process of adjustment and developing, evaluating and promoting effective interventions. So you can see the important elements are there. It's, it's promoting wellbeing, not just uh, treating depression and anxiety. Although as a clinical psychologist, I kind of prioritise the people with the most levels of distress for obvious reasons, I guess. And what we're trying to do with this part of the, uh, the CRE is really look at uh, across the range of experiences of someone as they go uh, along their stroke journey. So we're working um, to give access to people with aphasia to mental health and wellbeing opportunities. We're working with the health professionals. So that involves you know, training people and particularly think people in the context of aphasia like speech pathologists, understanding and training them in mental health issues so they can recommend and refer on and even provide basic step one interventions themselves. And we'll be talking a little about one of the programs later on to do that. Looking at the level of the health service and how um, people generally, apart from speech pathologists and professionals, deal with this issue so that um, people get opportunities for it. It's no good having people trained and screening and identifying problems unless they can roll things out. And then wider and particularly work by Michelle Adard is looking at the community opportunities when people are quite a long way out of their stroke 
uh, and having their aphasia uh, in the long term, you know, how, what can we do in the community to support individuals in that category that preserves their mental health and promotes their quality of life? So in that respect, you know, I recommend these two pro these three projects to you, which are our beacon projects, which means they're the prime projects we want to get through, but it is worth thinking that in terms of optimizing uh, mental health and well-being, uh, part of the CRE is uh, broader than this. And I think we've got a list of about 15 projects that we're snowballing towards at the moment, now, which is a bit intimidating, but uh, exciting at the same time. So the three main problems are modified cognitive behaviour therapy. So this is CBT um, and uh, applying that within the spectrum of people with different levels of communication difficulty. Peer-led community aphasia support services, which I think is self-explanatory, and developing step psychological care within a health care provider. So within the, the health service setting that we I talked about earlier. So with the modified CBT, I think it's important to think about um, our very good colleagues down in um, Monash who are helping us with this, and uh, Sonia Thomas, who's developed uh, the treatment manual for it, and of course, a number of our postdocs involved in this program, Brooke Ryan, Carolyn Babka, and Priscilla from uh, Monash. And really, this is talking about, this is um, a, a meta-analysis looking at CBT for depression after stroke. And um, I won't go into a lot of it, uh, and, and I can't because many of it's being done in China, and so it's hard for me to read and understand some of those things. Um, but essentially, it's board pointing the way towards it being effective. But one of the problems is, as I've talked to a colleague, uh, a Chinese colleague who has been involved in it, is that most of the studies mention that CBT requires customised adaption to post-stroke depression for people with aphasia or cognitive problems. But of course, in these clinical papers, no one says how they adapted the program. Uh, and of course that led to significant heterogeneity between the different studies. So really what we're looking at is documenting and manualizing a program that's been successfully led by a clinician in the past and evaluating that uh, so that we can roll it out and train people in doing this uh, modified CBT. Uh, and we're doing a case series, um, which includes all the elements of CBT, but also adapted for supportive communication so that people with different levels of communication can still benefit from one of the best researched and proven uh, treatments for depression and anxiety in, um, in, in the general population. So standard overall structure with homework, um, essentially those of you who don't know much about cognitive behaviour therapy is talking about what you do and what you think about and how you might you know, do things differently or think about things differently in a way that's less likely uh, to uh, lead to emotional distress. So as simple as, you know, my life's over now, I've had a stroke versus, um, well, some things have changed, but I can still do things I can enjoy. I can still be with my children, those sorts of things. So a more balanced approach sometimes, I'd say. And, you know, instead of being depressed and sitting at home, getting out and doing things that you enjoy because proportionally that increases uh, your mood state in a positive way. Um, so for instance, what we know from the communication and low moods, Australia's graded behavioural activation tasks can be very useful in this population. And this is what we want to exploit in the CBT program. So here you have the, the step program of someone going uh, down to the garden centre, buying some uh, things for, for and taking them home and starting to build up and uh, use the, the, the gardening skills and looking after plants as a way of re-engaging with the environment and pleasant activities and feeling mastery and those sorts of things, which can ameliorate depression. Um, one of the things to say about people with depression is often, you know, if you talked about doing all this in one hit, it's too much, it's a bit overwhelming. So that's why you can see there's a stepped approach here, um, which most of you would, with a psychology background, would be familiar with. So the single case design we've got, we're hoping to recruit eight participants, randomised into uh, uh, different baseline experiences. This is to um, Perform the best quality studies with, in terms of the, uh, the current practices in single case design, having uh, around about 10 sessions, uh, which we're hoping will be enough to make a difference. And using those measures that particularly developed for this population, the DIS, the bar, the SADQ H10, which you've seen earlier, uh, to collect data and mood. Um, and uh, we'll be starting to recruit for that shortly, hopefully in Melbourne. 
So community aphasia groups, um, one of the things uh, with, with in this situation is um, they meet regularly and so on. And this is really Michelle um, Attard's work. Uh, and there's some work that's been done historically in this area. Uh, and people have had different iterations or developments in this in terms of conversation, practice, communication, therapy, participation, meaningful activities, social support, psychological support, education about aphasia and stroke. So there's been very, very different contents to do with that. Uh, with the overall aim of living well with aphasia. And some of the research has come out with some of these things being the optimal uh, way of moving forward in the communication space uh, in terms of support. So communication aphasia groups um, are the way forward, we think. And one of the things that's particularly important and being developed is, is to make these um, accessible to um, the uh, uh, population with aphasia so that they can run them themselves. And um, in terms of the evidence today, communication disability, psychosocial consequences of aphasia uh, are seen as being important elements that are addressed. And certainly this works valued by attendees. Um, some of the key issues though, um, highlighted by speech pathologists is that 30% are often dissatisfied with groups of food service, there's problems with funding, uh, dominated by the subacute sector rather than the community. Some groups are only very short, lack of staff, transport venues, uh, training, uh, packaging and development of materials. So a bit like the CBTs, there isn't a manualised version that people can roll out. Um, so we're trying to look at moving that forward and making a difference to that and using uh, group members as a resource rather than a recipient of service. We're obviously very empowering people with aphasia to be involved in this way. Um, also aphasia specific communication tra training to support member interactions and so forth. Um, and also providing opportunities for members to observe a group and build an understanding. So training and developing in this area uh, to develop the programs. Kind of hub and spoke model starting out with having peer facilitators and then going out to other groups with training and support. And this is good progress on this at this point. Um, we're currently doing the training, I understand, for Michelle, which is very exciting. Uh, and there's going to be a phase two trial with eight groups uh, after the phase one data. And we're developing the training resource of the program manual and so forth, which is very important to allow this to be replicated elsewhere in the community. It's going to be a 12-week program, looking at group process, conversation, supportive communication, peer support, and identity issues. Session content can include leisure and exercise and supporting mental health. The outcome measures we're using are quality of life, aphasia severity, and also the BOA and the stroke aphasic depression questionnaire, the 21 item version there, because it's kind of more comprehensive and more likely to give us what we're looking for in terms of outcome data. Quality of life measures, care of burden, care of perception of people with aphasia. So we are, luckily, this part of the program, uh, helping people with aphasia. Um, so I'm just going back to the step care model here, you know, my triangles disappeared and um, looking at level one, this is something that uh, Carolyn Baker is doing in the next part of the program. And um, she's already done a systematic review to look at what might work to prevent and treat depression in people with post-stroke aphasia on which we're basing our work. And it's really moving forward to a feasibility study. So we wanna test whether aphasia prism, which is uh, prevention and intervention support in mental health, people with aphasia, and see if the program's acceptable, feasible to deliver, uh, and has outcomes. Obviously, those with once again we've got a small amount of funding, but essentially the program exists of training a number of people, not psychologists necessarily, but speech pathologists uh, and um, other allied health people in a number of techniques which are appropriate within their level of um, training. Uh, and capacity, including things like behavioural activation, increasing pleasant events, problem solving therapy and relaxation therapy. Um, so these can be delivered as part of a, a level one intervention in step care uh, within a Monash health service system. Um, so not just running a trial to see if these things work, but seeing if they work in practice and not necessarily when they have to be rolled out by a psychologist. The important Issue here, of course, is you don't need a psychologist for everybody as much as we might like that. Uh, and also, you know, the resources aren't there to provide that. 
So it's a mixed methods feasibility design. So there's uh, to nine participants that we uh, at their uh, preference to which therapy they're involved with and which therapist. And then there'll be a range of baseline measures and post intervention. And we also, part of post intervention, will be looking at the acceptability of the program uh, with the same measures, but also, very importantly, semi structured interviews to find out what worked well and what didn't um, from both the participants, their family, and the health professionals' point of view. So that's the main things we're doing with optimizing mental health and wellbeing uh, in part of the CRE. But there's a, a few other projects uh, that we've got, already got some data on. So uh, mental health literally levels of graduate speech pathologists. We wanted to see whether there was a change in that over the course of their training. Uh, hopefully they we were looking at there being one. Looking at how very low rates of screening. So the rates of screening in the UK are up to 90% in terms of looking for anxiety and depression people after stroke. Um, they're as low as 8% in different parts of Australia, even though it's recommended for people who show um, they might be at risk. Um, and also, Jazz Secon at uh, La Trobe is doing um, search for a PhD, looking at developing uh, postgraduate speech pathology counselling skills training, because there is clearly not a, a standard within the profession uh, that's achieved through uh, uh, first qualification. And uh, there's great demand for this because people see it as a central part of their role. So the help seeking for mood disorders with Australia looked at, it was a qualitative study, a national study, and we managed to get uh, uh, 18 speech and language persons, psychologists, well, at least um, Carolyn Baker did work with people with aphasia. And, um, and of course, this is um, actually, it's not Carolyn, it's Brooke Ryan, sorry, Brooke and JC. Um, eight speech pathologists working with people with post-stroke aphasia and really looking at the double aphasia, communication is a barrier. But strip, um, things like treatment stigma as well being a barrier, um, both in terms of, I think, the speech pathologists and indeed uh, people with aphasia. Um, and also looking at what blocked people moving on. So this is some of the work we're trying to, uh, as the basis for overcoming access to people with aphasia. The interesting study with uh, mental health literacy as speech and language uh, pathology students was really um, to see whether they had the sort of level of understanding of emotional problems and their treatment uh, that would be desirable given their exposure to people at high risk, people with aphasia, swallowing problems and so forth. And we looked at 78 speech pathology students and very interesting results really because uh, the comparison group or called the community group is that, uh, that year one psychology students were at the same level as year one speech pathology students. By year four, speech pathology students, as you can see from the, the bar graphs, were somewhere halfway between um, uh, their starting point and where a mental health professional might be. And I think that's quite uh, a good finding, really, that over the experience of the degree, people are getting understandings. I'm not sure of the mechanism of how they're getting those understandings, uh, but it's very interesting to see that that's happening. And we have to look at that data more closely to see what they are actually understanding and whether there are anything we need to work on in that respect. So that's kind of all I've, I've got prepared for you today. So happy to have some uh, uh, questions and um, some feedback if uh, we can hand over to our colleagues at La Trobe for that, I think. Thank you. Hello, anyone at La Trobe? Hello, yes, we're here. Ah, great. Perfect. Okay, great. So, thank you so much, Ian. And we have several questions here. Um, the first one is about the CBT training manual. Um, will it become available for clinicians? And I noticed that there's a question further down about training manuals in general and whether those will be accessible. Uh, well, the, the, the answer to that is, you know, we very much hope so. I mean, I guess the thing with the uh, the CBT training is um, what you need is foundational training to be able to um, to deliver CBT for this quite challenging group. 
So um, it will come with recommendations and training materials about, about that. But I think the first point is once we've done our feasibility trial, then we'll run an RCT and, and once it's proven, we'll roll out the, the manual to become available. Uh, and um, hopefully support, particularly psychologists, I think, so in, in that, that. Hey, that's good. How can we overcome stigma? Some patients don't want help from a psychologist or even to talk about their feelings. Ah, yes, well, this is not just a problem for um, people with aphasia, of course. I think one of the, the issues is giving people the resources. I actually found many people with stroke are just grateful to talk to somebody. I think one of the ways around this is, you know, you're looking at that step care model and we're talking about allied health providing that. So it may actually not be a psychologist that's doing it, but you're doing it um, with your speech pathologist or with your uh, occupational therapist. So, for instance, leisure rehabilitation has a lot of in, in common with um, uh, behavioural activation and community participation um, as part of uh, speech pathology training interact. So I think if we can deliver those services where people feel comfortable, which is often with, you know, a primary therapist, uh, such as a, a species or, or not, we can get some of the ways to do that. And as people see the benefits of that, they may well be able to um, step up to psychological treatment. They also think over time, um, people becoming more psychologically minded, more able to uh, go and see psychologists. Um, but it's, it's not the easiest thing. Thank you. Um, the next question is from a speech pathologist. They're asking, is it okay for me to use some of the mood screens that you talked about? Oh, absolutely. I'd recommend we're doing some training. We've just trained a whole lot of people at a, 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 a major hospital, not too far from where I'm sitting. And um, that included people like speech pathologists and physiotherapists and so on. Um, I, I think that people are reluctant to diagnose anxiety and depression. Now, I think you've got to remember these screens are just saying that this may be the case for this person and um, is designed to identify someone who could do with more, more formal assessment and so on. So I think, you know, you, you certainly can use all these things. Many of them are available on the internet anyway. And um, as long as you, you know, you realize you're not diagnosing or anxiety, I think that's fine. Okay, so I think the next question underneath that has also been covered more broadly. Um, thank you. Are there any resources detailing the psychologists who specialise in working with people in patient care? No, no, I'm Sonia, who was um, who's not involved there. There isn't anything uh, available on that. We are hoping through the CRE uh, at some point to. Uh, if you log on to the Australian Psychological Society, it says people who have uh, who are bilingual and can work in different languages. We're hoping to put people who have done supportive communication training up there and train them if we can find the therapy is effective in, in behavioural activation, problem solving, these sorts of things and how to work with people so that um, that resource will be available just as is as much as if you want to see an Italian speaking psychologist. Mm. Um. If there are concerns about suicide for a person with aphasia in a community setting, how might this be managed? Okay, well, I think, you know, it depends on your, your, your training. If you've done sort of mental health, um, first aid, those sorts of things, uh, that will answer some of those issues. But if you're uh, very concerned about somebody or just concerned about it, you need to refer them to somebody like their GP or someone who's uh, been trained in doing a mental health ass assessment to determine risk. That sort of should be more, bear in mind, it's very hard to predict who will and who won't, will, will not take their own life. Um, but, you know, certainly some people with stroke and some people my experience have done that. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's referring, referring them on, unless you, you've got a, a job where you're trained in risk assessment and you should have a decision tree. So if you looked at the, that decision tree in the screening is what the, if there's suicide risk, then the person in that hospital setting is referred to the medical officer on duty who comes and, and does an assessment. Okay, um, we've got a question about strategies. Is there anything we can use to encourage participation or compliance during the uh, acute slash rehab stage? Okay, yeah, there's a range, range of things um, and uh, I've got, it's probably a whole seminar to go through, <laughs> through all those different strategies, but it, it, it can be uh, simple things like uh, motivational interviewing can be very successful in getting people, you know, you know, for instance, you know, if you get up and you think you're going to fall over, you're probably going to go sit over again. But if you talk to someone and say, well, if you keep doing that, you may not get home. 
that can be quite sobering for somebody. And that sounds a bit abrasive the way I put it there, but if it's done in the right context with the right relationship with the person, that can be quite motivating. Um, and also, you know, looking at rewards and, and opportunities uh, and for instance, um, people who aren't eating, breaking down meals into smaller component parts. Um, and, you know, I've written a couple of papers on this that um, we can put on the uh, CRE website if people are interested. Just to, just to say more on that is it's, it's about pointing out the benefits. Now, don't assume your clients know why you're doing stuff. So I've certainly seen people who are refusing physiotherapy and they didn't kind of understand what it was leading to and so on. And you've got to remember a lot of our clients have cognitive communication problems. So you've got to be very explicit and very clear, uh, particularly in these groups and, and, you know, plot out why, you know, you're getting the standard of plinth to start with and what that might build upon uh, and don't assume too much. Okay. Um, another question here is what advice can you offer speech pathologists that want to engage with this but want to be also mindful? to not go beyond this frame of practice. And that leads to a question further down around the acute hospital setting and uh, working jointly with, with psychologists. I think one of the things is to, you know, to be very mindful of the boundaries of your, of your practice, but many of allied health, including speech pathologists I've worked with, you know, you, you often abandon a session because someone's so distressed or upset to do that. If you're doing that, uh, you know, every second session and you're not doing the speech pathological work that you're you're, you're doing, I think that's a, a sign that you need to refer on or to address it if you have the skills. So it's not about what profession you've got, but the skills you've got. So one of the things we're looking at is these foundational skills like behavioral activation, problem solving, and uh, relaxation training are very accessible to people across the allied health spectrum. And if you've got those, you can try those things. But once again, if there's a risk there for suicide or self-harm, uh, you can um, do that. It's ideal to get supervision from a psychologist if you can, if that's not available. Some of these basic things, if people are in the clinical range, uh, I think are fine to do. Great. Um, this one's about a support group. Any practical tips on encouraging people with aphasia to take on leadership or ownership in their group? Some members can be too passive or too aggressive. Uh, sorry, I missed the part. Some members can be too passive or too, too aggressive. Sorry. Sorry, still can't hear. Which one are you talking about? Which? Um... Oh. Oh. Just at the top there, are there any practical tips on encouraging people with aphasia in a support group to take on leadership or ownership? I think I think that's a question for you, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's about um, promoting different roles within the group. Um, and having people within the group that can serve as, as models. So the facilitators themselves would ideally be selected because they um, embody particular characteristics, um, a degree of positivity um, and openness to run, to um, facilitate and to support the members in the group. Um, and through that modeling and sort of um, encouraging and supporting members, um, hopefully they would also start to take on some of those roles as well. I think it, it particularly comes from getting a sense of what the members want and need and how to maximise on that so that they feel like it's a meaningful experience. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I think that's they're all very salient points. Michelle, of course, is the lead on um, the community groups we're developing, so she's very well positioned to do that, which yeah. kind of, I guess, shows you that this can be a multidisciplinary effort. Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge team effort and happy to continue those discussions um, on Twitter and so on. Um, we've also got a question here about CBT. So why CBT instead of other interventions? Is there pharmacological intervention available? Well, I mean, CBT is, um, is the most proven uh, psychological treatment for anxiety and, de and depression. Um, and there is, you know, you can provide pharmacological interventions as well, but you've got to remember the majority of stroke people are older adults and, you know, the problems with drug interactions and side effects can be quite uh, pronounced in that population. And, you know, basically people would rather have psychological therapy than drugs in general. I think that applies to the um, stroke population as well as the general population. Okay, we've got a question about peer support programs. Are there any one-to-one -one programs available? 
Uh, not, not that I'm aware of, but you need to look at your local community, talk to the people in the stroke association, those sorts of things. I think they have lists of groups and so on available, but one-to-one -one peer support, um, you know, I don't think is being rolled out in, in Australia as yet, and that's certainly an opportunity there, I think. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, the UK is um, the, the beacon in this area um, with peer befriending, particularly coming out of um, Connect, now Aphasia Reconnect as one example. Um, but yes, it's certainly an area that we could uh, expand on in Australia. Ian, there's another question here about um, strategies. Where would we access these strategies that you're talking about, things like behavioural activation? Well, of course, psychologists and clinical psychologists have uh, are very aware of this as a foundational treatment in, in depression. Um, but of course, we're providing that within the CRE5, the Monash program that we're hoping to talk about. So that actually the person who's got more resources about that is Carolyn Baker. So you can certainly contact her about that. There is a manual available and they've rolled it out uh, partly in the, in the UK. You know, it's the first proven treatment, I think, for depression in in people with stroke, let alone people with stroke who have communication problems. So um, certainly, Shirley Thomas there is a font of all knowledge on behavioural activation. As I say, your local psychologist would have information about that. Carolyn Baker can be contacted with the manual uh, yes. to, to roll that out. Uh, be aware though of uh, working within you know the boundaries of your practice if you're not a, a clinical psychologist or a neuropsychologist. We do have a little bit of time remaining. Um, I wonder, Ian, if you might like to chat to speak to a few of those other programs that you touched on at the end, um, beyond the vegan projects, perhaps expand on those a little bit, or any other. There's, 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 there's so many of them. I think uh, one of the interesting things that Brooke Ryan's been doing with, uh, and some of our other postdocs with people at City University is, is looking at very importantly including people with mental health uh, problems and aphasia in research because people, as we know, with aphasia are often excluded because um, it's you know, too hard basket basically. So some of the foundation work that they're writing up at the moment is about what people think about, including people with uh, aphasia in research and how they can do things like consent forms and all those sorts of things to, su to support that, which should have benefits in the, the long term. Um, some of the other things we're looking at is, you know, I talked about the screening program where we're looking at how we can uh, get allied health to take on board screening within um, stroke unit settings and other settings as well. Um, and we've really worked at seeing that as, uh, you know, People like the training, but whether they actually enact it depends on a whole lot of factors in terms of the sport and the environment. And also you only need one group to do it. So where we were working recently, the medical doctors um, ended up doing the training and and also, you know, once we gave them the right resources in terms of what to use and when, they just ran with it. Um, so the allied health were kind of let off the hook a bit there. Um, so that was an interesting experience in terms of one of the further projects. We're looking at also rolling out accessible online treatments for people uh, because of stigma and because of access issues with disability. So looking at online, perhaps behavioural activation of people with stroke, but they might be supported by a carer or, or not, depending on their needs to uh, participate in that. And we've got some exciting um, grant applications going forward soon in that area. Um, I guess some of the other things that we're, we've been looking at uh, include um, the uh, ability to identify uh, aphasia specific resources for people uh, and you know Brooke Ryan's recently done some great work looking at online treatments for um, things like Mood Gym for people with aphasia and how that might be modified and you know we've got some supports uh, dare I say it from Black Dog at this point <laughs> in that area in terms of um, at least some discussions about that sort of work uh, which is very important because, you know, we know people more and more are going online and there's some great opportunities to do uh, something in that space. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ian. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your participation in our seminar today. If you've got a moment, please provide some feedback by Slido under the survey tab. And if you didn't have a chance earlier, you can still answer the question about the number of people in your room to help us out with collecting that data. Um, we look forward to hosting the next seminar on Wednesday the 25th of March. We're really excited to have Dr. Robin O'Halloran
from Trove University presenting hospital care for people with aphasia, our long term perspective. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.